Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus, and we ask you to release a spirit of grace and impartation. Strengthen our hearts, touch our bodies, inspire us in the name of Jesus. We say amen and amen. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Shout out your praise. Let's join them singing this new song together. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout.
joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out. joy is our strength in the trials in the shaking it's your joy that sustains us it's your joy that strengthens us joy that doesn't make sense peace that doesn't make sense Open our eyes to see that eternal reality. Unending joy, unending peace that sustains us, that carries us through all this life has. For everything the road ahead has in store, let your joy remain. Thank you. 
Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, you're beautiful.
We're going to have communion stations up at the front as well as all around in the back. Matthew 26, Jesus said, verse 26, Take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. As we take the Lord's Supper this morning, we remember that his body was given for us, that the Lord himself said, take, eat. As we drink, we remember the blood of Jesus, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And we remember that his blood today speaks a better word over us. And we remember that he is coming back and we will again eat with Jesus in the kingdom. So Lord, as we take this today, we remember you and we say we love you. Go ahead and come forward. Find the station that's closest to you. Gather with your family or friends and, and pray as we receive the Lord's Supper. Oh. 
receive all the glory, all the honor, Jesus. Your people say you are holy and beautiful. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brenton. Worship team, go ahead and remain standing. We're going to recite the Apostles' Creed together. Follow along on the screen for those who don't have it memorized. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Take a minute and greet those around you. Reach a hand, shake it. Go ahead and find your seat. Stuart Greaves is going to be sharing the word with us this morning. Stuart's one of the leaders on our base. Many of you know for 20 plus years, we love Stuart. If you want a copy of the notes, if you didn't grab them on your way, our ushers have them. You can go ahead and raise your hand. All right, I see that hand. Good. Go ahead and pull out your bulletin. I want to highlight a few announcements today. Uh, as always, right after service in the Welcome Center area, uh, we have our Next Steps team. We would love to connect with you, whether you're brand new at the church or you've been here for a while and you just want to get more connected, more plugged in. Uh, we have lots of opportunities from friendship groups to serving to classes. Uh, come meet with us after church in the Next Steps area at the back. Well, um, as many of you know, for many years, we did the One Thing Conference, and you know, tens of thousands would come to Kansas City, and a few years back, we felt from the Lord that it was time to shut that down, to stop doing One Thing Conferences, and we did so because the Lord was really highlighting the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to begin to grow and excel in a family spirit as we engage in our mandate and prayer and intimacy with Jesus, the forerunner message, and fasting and engaging with him. And so we shut down the One Thing Conference as a way of creating margin and space to be able to connect in more profound ways with one another, with him. And so uh, the big announcement is that we are, as of this fall, Jumping back into a, a national conference, international conference, that's the big announcement. The reason that we're, yes. No, I appreciate that. I like that you're clapping because some people are like, what? How, how dare we? Didn't the Lord say? The, we've always had a, a messaging mandate on our house and a mandate to proclaim his message, the word, to the nations. But how to do that in a way that doesn't sacrifice our primary calling as intercessors to minister as priests before the Lord? How do we do both? How do we actually have a vibrant prayer life and actually pull off a large-scale conference? We believe that we found a way. So we're gonna be engaging around our anniversary, September 16th through the 18th, 
what we're calling the Return Conference. And this conference is going to be primarily online. It's going to be a little bit here and a lot of it everywhere. And so we've got a, a little teaser for you. We'll talk more about that in the days to come. How are we going to pull that off? But, uh, but we wanted to tell you in advance before we tell everyone because we want you in on that story because for us, the story is personal. How do we have a life in God and lay hold of what the Lord's asked for us to do in the days ahead? We believe this is the first step in before the Lord trying to answer that question. So if we could run that little teaser, it'll give you a taste of what's coming. Is that actually the teaser of the teaser? <laughs> is there another video we should be expecting? <laughs> that is the teasiest teaser in the history of teasers. That is absolutely true. Heads up, there's going to be a video that's a teaser. Here's a teaser for that teaser. No, when Dean Briggs produces a teaser, he knows how to actually get us leaning in. So we're thankful for them. Serious question, though, is there going to be merch? Because I know a lot of people are really, like, wearing out their old One Thing shirts. Number one on your announcements. <laughs> we are uh, coming up on Monday doing what we do every month, our Global Bridegroom Fast. We've been doing this now since 2002, and we're going to be engaging Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday with prayer, fasting, trying to slow down and, and engage in contending together for revival, Kansas City and beyond. And as usual, we want to invite you to engage and participate with us according to the grace of God, your ability to do so. We know that not everybody can do a ton of prayer meetings, but to whatever degree we're able to fast, pray, and engage together for breakthrough, revival, ultimately with the turn of the Lord, we want to do that together. All right. Announcement number two on your bulletin. We have our intro to the prayer room class coming up this Tuesday. Um, this class is really designed to be a place where you can learn about why we do 24-7 prayer and also what's happening in the prayer room. I know a lot of times people go to the prayer room, they love it. They don't know all the reasons for why we do things the way we do and they want to ask questions, but they don't know where to do that. This class is a great uh, place to come and go, hey, what is that that's happening in the prayer room? And how do I participate? We want you to feel the ownership of that room as a community. So check that out, announcement number two. And just heads up, that's also available for those who can't make it in person. You can join via Zoom. Come on. Well, if you look at number three, Monday night is a really significant prayer meeting. All of our prayer meetings are significant to the Lord. But this one is of particular significance related to the crisis that's happening right now in Myanmar. And uh, it's a genuine crisis, a military coup, a violence, a widespread death, oppression. And so we're taking time on Monday to participate with many others in the global day of prayer for Myanmar. And our little part, we're going to take the, the Monday, 8 p.m., we're going to gather together and we're going to cry out to the Lord for breakthrough for our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ and beyond that are really in a place of something beyond instability and they need a breakthrough. And so it's a small thing that we do, but, but again, before the Lord, from heaven's perspective, it is significant as a family that we contend for our brethren in Myanmar in this time. All right, look at the bottom of your bulletin, and it will also be up on the screen. We have a new uh, text-to-give code. Um, it's actually a phone number, so just want to take note of that if you use that to give electronically. And hey, while we're at it, let's have the ushers come forward to receive our offering. So, Lord, as we come today... God, we remember that you are the God who supplies all our needs according to your riches in glory. God, that you know what we need even before we ask. Lord, that you are mindful of us. 
God. And so as we come and we give our finances, Lord, we give in faith knowing that you are worthy of our trust. Lord, and I ask that as we sow, Lord, you would meet every need, finance, Lord. God, that you would multiply the sowing of finance and let your kingdom purposes go forth through our lives today. In Jesus' name. Tanya Bowser with me to John chapter 13. And uh, if you would like to have the notes and I don't have them, just go ahead and raise your hand and then the ushers will, will get the notes to you. John chapter 13. All right, let's pray. Father, we... We thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we ask you that you would uh, release the light of the Holy Spirit, Lord, all across this room, upon our hearts, upon our minds. Lord, that you would open up our eyes to your word, Lord, to see uh, glorious things, Father, concerning you and your son. And Father, we ask you that you would uh, release your spirit to magnify the Son of God upon our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, John chapter 13, you know, here in the last uh, several months, uh, the Lord um, in our midst has been highlighting uh, the importance of John chapter 13 to 17. 
Uh, we had a, a time of, of 40 days of focus, the seeking of the Lord uh, back in March. And uh, the Lord began to highlight in our midst the, the subject of the Laodicea in spirit and how the, um, uh, how the Lord is calling the church of Laodicea uh, to buy gold and to, uh, and to open up their hearts and to enter into a place of, of communion with the Lord. And uh, during that time, just in different ways, the Lord began to emphasize that, uh, that John 13 to 17 is one of the premier places to go to to begin finding insight in terms of how to begin the walking free, really from that spirit of compromise into wholeheartedness. Now, when I think about the scripture, when I think about the word of God, uh, one of the things I think of, I, I think of the scripture uh, like, really like this vast ocean. And, uh, uh, you know, it says in Psalm uh, 119, verse 96, it says that his law is exceedingly broad. Uh, there are layers to God's word that are just absolutely profound. And even in the age to come, we're going to see things concerning him um, in the word that are just going to surprise us. Uh, Psalm uh, 119 verse 18, the psalmist prays that the Lord would open up our eyes to his law to see marvelous things. So it's not just information, but we get to see things that that move us, things that fascinate us, things that capture our hearts concerning uh, the knowledge of him. You know, again, you know, Jesus in John 5, he says, look, he says, these scriptures, he said that, he says, you searched them out, but you're not taking the next step. You told the Pharisees this, you're not taking the next step to, to come to me because the fact is that the scriptures, they testify of me. They speak about who I am. And so when I think about the word of God I, as, this, as this ocean, you know, it's like, you know, when you go over the ocean, you see that the ocean has various uh, shades of blue, so to speak. And, uh, and the, the brighter the blue, the, uh, it gets a little more shallow. And the, and the darker the blue, it gets, uh, the, the, it means that the, the, the depth of the ocean is, is increasing there. But when I think of John 13 to 17, it is a really, really dark blue part of the ocean. I mean, the depth... Uh, that is to be found there about uh, the beauty of Jesus as Father uh, and the Spirit, the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and, and their desire and their plan and their way to invite the redeemed into that relational dynamic as our inheritance, as our primary destiny. is just absolutely amazing. Paragraph A the primary theme of uh, John 13 to 17 is Jesus is speaking to his disciples about the subject of the love of God and God's glory. I mean, there's so much there to be found about the relationship between the Father and the Son. There are uh, at least five components that I could find of the love of God found in these five chapters. Uh, we see God's love for God. And then we see God's love towards us, and then we find out that God's love towards us is the same love that God has towards God. Uh, and then we see uh, our love for God, and that our love for God is to be the exact same love that God has for God. And then the fourthly, we see uh, uh, our love for one another, and that we are to love one another in the way that God loves God. And then the fifth component is we see uh, God's love for the world through the apostolic witness, that we see that love manifested to a world that is incredibly hostile to God and his son and to the gospel. And so there's so much to be seen about uh, the depth of God's love in these, uh, in these five chapters, and that ultimately that our destiny is to be wrapped up, is to be swallowed up, so to speak, in the glory of God, that Jesus prays in John 17, 5, he says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the foundations of the world. And then about 17 verses later, in verse 22, he says, Father, the glory that you've given me, which is the glory that he had before the foundations of the earth, he says, I give that glory to them. I give that glory to the people of God. And so, beloved, the thing that, uh, is in store for us and this thing called salvation is, is truly uh, 
uh, what, what Paul says, that no eye has seen nor ear has heard. Well, in John chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Now the Passover, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew what, uh, um, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, and that he, that he should depart from this world. It's the time of the Passover, and Jesus knows that it is his time to, uh, to go to the cross. And uh, the thing that he does is that he shows them, he loved those who were his own, and he showed them, one translation says, the full extent of his love. And it, in some ways, I think it gives a thesis, so to speak, of what John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 is all about. It's about us discovering the extent to which God's love goes. And, uh, and only to find out that the prophet Jeremiah had it right. And when the Lord told him in Jeremiah 33, 1, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Now, what we find here is that the context of John 13 to 17 is the Passover, the feast of the Passover. Now, because it's the Gospel of John, it, it drives us, it forces us to take a closer look at why the mention of the Passover is important. You just go with me for a moment and go to paragraph C. I'm going a little bit out of order here, and we get to do that. But um, for the second part of paragraph C, uh, what we see there is that the synoptic gospels emphasize the Passover as a prophetic event. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they talk about the Passover, but they uh, talk about the Passover as a prophetic event. It, in other words, it, it only really shows up once in those three Gospels, and it shows up in the context of Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples on his way to the cross. And it's making this point that as the Passover processes are unfolding, the examining of the lamb, finding the lamb, that the lamb is without blemish and so forth, uh, during that same time, the lamb of God is being examined and found without blemish, and he dies uh, uh, on the cross. Now, the Gospel of John does the same thing, but it adds a dimension to it. The Passover in John is not only mentioned as a prophetic event, but it's mentioned as a prophetic theme throughout the book. Throughout the Gospel of John, the Passover shows up about eight or nine times from starting in chapter 2 all the way there toward, uh, uh, towards the end. We see the Passover just gets highlighted by John over and over and over again. The other thing that's to be noted about John is that John is unique. The Apostle John is unique in his emphasis on Jesus as the Lamb of God, both in the Gospel of John as well as in the book of Revelation. John is the only one who emphasizes. Peter gets a little mention of it in, in 1 Peter, but John is the only one who really lays out the implications of Jesus being the Lamb of God. He gets introduced as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by John the Baptist and so forth, but it is, but it is consistent with with John's emphasis on this Passover dynamic. And because of that theme, I think it is important that we uh, uh, look into the Passover a bit more because it is connected to what the Lord is speaking to us in John 13 to 17. Paragraph B, uh, the Passover uh, was the time of the supernatural emancipation of Hebrew slaves and their departure into the wilderness towards the promised land. Israel, in Exodus chapter 12, was instructed to sacrifice the lamb and place its blood on their homes, and this would serve to be a sign that would identify them as the people of God, and secondly, it would serve as a protection uh, against the judgments that God was uh, bringing uh, in, uh, in the land of Egypt. Now, if you look there on the notes there, I got Exodus chapter 12, verse uh, 12 and 14. I just want to draw your attention to verse 14. The Lord tells uh, the, the, uh, the nation of Israel, he says, look, he goes, I want you to keep this day 
as a memorial. I want you to keep this as a feast, as an everlasting ordinance. And what that tells me is that there is growing understanding that the Lord wants to give us about the Passover. If anything, which is probably the real pinnacle understanding of the Passover, is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 17, where Paul says that Jesus is not just the Passover lamb, he is, in fact, the Passover. Jesus Christ, the Passover. And the Lord wants to give us, I think, understanding, again, through the word and dialoguing with one another, growing together and understanding the significance of what the Passover is all about. Paragraph C, the Passover foreshadows Jesus as the Passover lamb of God who delivers us from our sin and this evil age. That is our exodus. In fact, I think there are four, if I can say it this way, there are four elements to the Passover and the exodus. Uh, the first exodus is found in Exodus chapter 12. It's, the, uh, it's when the Lord is delivering the people of God from the oppression of Egypt to lead them into the promised land. The first exodus is God, through power, delivering his people from the oppression of, the, uh, 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 of Egypt into the promised land, number one. Number two, the, the second exodus is Jesus' own departure from the world into his Father's glory. And I think it's no accident that John chapter 13, verse, uh, verse one, makes that point that at the time of the Passover, Jesus now knows it is the time of his departure or, or the time of his Exodus. Thirdly, it is the exodus that we experience through the born again experience. That through the power of the cross, the grace of God, we are being delivered from the oppression of sin, number one. And number two, we're being let out of this evil and present age, as it says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. That when Jesus died on the cross, when you and I were born again, it was not just give, not just about you know, uh, uh, cleaning us up a little bit. Yes, it was about cleaning us up, but it was about delivering us from the, from, uh, from the evil taskmaster called sin and to deliver us from this evil and present age, bringing us into the promised land, which the scripture calls the age to come. Then there's a the fourth exodus, and that's the eschatological exodus. It's now where Israel again finds herself under the oppression of the eschatological pharaoh called the Antichrist. And the Lord delivers her from the Antichrist kingdom in the context of the second coming of Jesus and the rapture of the saints. And so looking at each one of those components, I think that the Passover has a lot of insight for us in the Holy Spirit. When we think about the Passover, as I mentioned earlier, it's mentioned in the Gospels, the Gospel of John specifically, several times in the book of Revelation. We see that there are saving or salvation components related to the, uh, uh, the Passover. There are pastoral components to the Passover, and there are end time or eschatological components with regards to the Passover. Let's turn the page over to uh, page, uh, page two. As I mentioned earlier, we had just uh, completed a season of 40 days of seeking the Lord during which time the Lord began to speak about the Laodicean spirit that needs to be confronted in, in our own lives. It was, a, it was an amazing season because the uh, passages about Laodicea, you know, is one of those passages when you read them, you, know, you think about the guy sitting next to you. You know, you know what do you think about? Okay, me, never mind. <laughs> no, but the miracle of those four days was how intentionally personal uh, many, if not all of us, make those passages go, wow, this is speaking to me. This is, the Lord is saying something to me. And there are uh, many facets and many components 
uh, related to the church of Laodicea that would, that would uh, comprise uh, the Laodicean spirit. Uh, uh, but the one that I think was really, really clear in the passage is that spirit of self-confidence, a self-righteousness, a self-reliance. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But the Lord began addressing this issue of the Laodicean spirit in our own lives and to turn to him and that, and that the turning to him involved several things, and, but at least two of them was the buying of gold from him and dining with him. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, that we would uh, uh, go to a place of, of fellowship, with, fellowship with the Lord. Now, as you recall, uh, during that time, and the Lord uh, had given Mike a, a very powerful open vision uh, about the open door. And, uh, and in that encounter, uh, the impression that, uh, that he received, if I remember this correctly, was that John 13 and 17 was one of the key places that we uh, are to turn to to begin finding his grace uh, for deliverance of this Laodicean spirit unto really the first commandment being established in our hearts in the first place. Uh, John 13 to 17 is a premier place to dine with Jesus. Uh, paragraph B uh, we are repenting in order to buy gold, that is to engage in God's, or, God's ordained process of acquiring a deep relationship with God as highlighted in John 13 to 17. In the buying of gold, we don't earn it, but we invest ourselves in a costly way, positioning ourselves in order to receive. And so we don't earn anything in the kingdom of God. But what we can do is we can position ourselves in a costly way, so, sorry, invest ourselves in a costly way to position ourselves to receive that which comes freely from the hand of God. Now, the thing that I mentioned earlier about the, the church of Laodicea is that it was a church of, of tremendous self-confidence, self-reliance, self-justification, uh, uh, a self-righteousness. The issue at the church of Laodicea wasn't their works. I mean, it, I mean, it wasn't that they weren't working. Jesus says, I know your works, but your works are, are, are in fact lukewarm. And the problem with the church of Laodicea, if I was to give one little sentence to it, is that they were a church who were seeking to engage the kingdom without deep fellowship with the Lord. Say this again. They were seeking to engage the kingdom the works of the kingdom, relating with God, relating with one another, they were seeking to do it in their own strength. They were seeking to do these things devoid from engaging with the Lord in that place of intimacy and fellowship, which really means asking the Lord for help. And the thing that stood out to me when, when, when Mike was sharing the testimony uh, about the open door vision was that it was in the context of asking the Lord to give us grace to open our hearts to him. Because you remember in Revelation chapter three, the Lord said, if, he said, I'm knocking at the door. If you open to me, uh, I will enter in and I will dine with you and you and, and you with me. And what I find interesting is that the, the prayer was, Lord, would you give us grace to open? And that is exactly what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about relying on the grace, the work, the cross, the blood of Christ in order to do the thing that he's asking us to do. And so, yes, we want to open up our hearts, but the truth is we cannot even open our hearts. If we want to open our hearts, we need to ask him to help us to open our hearts so that he can enter in. I want to, I want to, uh, I want to uh, read a verse for a second. I'm, I'm, I just talked myself into a certain mood here. Uh, <laughs> let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 29 just for a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 29. For some of you, that's the crispy part of your Bible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter uh, uh, 29, verse 4. Actually, let's go to verse 2 to kind of lead into it. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, you have seen all that the Lord did before you, before your eyes in the land of Egypt, and to Pharaoh and to all his servants and all his land. Verse three, the great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and, and those great wonders. He's talking about what happened essentially at the Passover. Now look what happened in verse four. 
Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and see. You, you see that verse? We need the Lord to give us a heart to see and perceive. In other words, the response to a Laodicean spirit is not the Laodicean spirit. <laughs> the response to the Laodicean spirit is, Lord, help. <laughs> help. Lord, you said that if I opened my heart, you would open up to me. Lord, I want to open up my heart, but I can't even do that. I need your help. Give me grace to open up my heart. And it is precisely because of this that the subject of the Passover lamb, which focuses on the work of Christ, is so essential moving forward into the Trinitarian fellowship that John chapter 13 to 17 talks about. Paragraph C, the, uh, uh, the central to the Passover is the sacrifice of the lamb and the appropriation or the application of his blood. In Mark 14, 12, it says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, which is referring to the Passover, when they killed the Passover lamb. That was a central issue to the Passover. It was the, was the sacrifice of the lamb and the application of his blood. And all throughout John 13 to 17, the Lord highlights this. Now, in John 13, 1, he starts out by saying, now with, as the feast of the Passover is approaching, but in Matthew chapter 26, we get a little bit more insight in, what, in terms of what was happening before Satan entered Judas and before Jesus began to wash his, the disciples' feet. And what we see is that Jesus gives a prophecy and he gives a teaching. He gives a prophecy about betrayal, number one. He gives a prophecy about the fact that they're, uh, they're all going to reject and deny him. And then he gives a teaching about his blood. He says, this, is, he, he goes, he, he breaks the bread and he says, eat this, for it is my body that is broken for you. And then he gives him this cup and he says, drink of it, all of you, because this is my blood for the remission of your sins. And it's for the kingdom and so forth. And so at the very beginning, at the very onset of looking at John 13 and 17, as we are saying yes to the Lord, say, Lord, Lord, we want to enter into, uh, into that glorious experience that you have available to us called the Trinitarian Dialogue, that which, was in, that which was made available through the free gift of the cross. Lord, would you give us insight into your shed blood that we might enter into this by the grace of God and not our own zeal and our own work. Essential to the subject of entering into the Trinitarian fellowship is the subject of his blood. Before anything, before anything that Jesus is about to talk about the, the great things about his blood, and uh, sorry, about the fellowship, about the union between him and his father and the spirit and the union that they desire to have with us through the born again experience. He goes, before anything, he goes, we must talk about the blood about the finished work of the cross. Paragraph D. Again, the sacrifice of Jesus is embedded in John 13 to 17. Here's what's important, is that the sacrifice is, the defin is how God's love is defined. All throughout the New Testament, no greater love has a man than this, and he would lay down his life for his friends. Romans 5, 8, for God demonstrated love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. First John, now this is love, not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us and gave himself as a propitiation for our sins. Revelation 1, 5, to him who loved us and washed us from his sin in his own blood. I mean, his love and his sacrifice are joined together over and over and over again in the New Testament. And this is important because if we don't have a sacrificial understanding of his love fundamentally, then we begin to yield to the sentimental definition of love that is floating in the culture. 
Because the culture talks love and it's sentiment. The culture talks community and it's sentiment. The culture talks family and it's sentiment. But in the New Testament, God talks love and it's cross. He talks community, it is cross. He talks family, it is cross. The cross becomes the foundation upon which our understanding of his love is built. And so we don't want to approach this invitation of John 13, 17 with a sentimentalized idea. We want to approach it with the understanding of the cross. That being said, built upon the cross are profound experiential component of, of feelings of love and pleasure and delight and peace and joy and so forth. But they're built upon the foundation of understanding that the love of God is defined by his cross. And that the way we express love for one another is defined by the cross. And several years ago, I had a, a dream. I honestly can't remember the year. I think it was 2012. But it was the same year that, um, that Whitney Houston passed away because it was the week that she passed away. And the dream involved a song that she used to sing. And in this dream, uh, I'm in the prayer room. I'm in the side room. And, uh, uh, and, and in one of the side rooms, what is the, the, in the side room, there was a picture. And the picture actually is in the prayer room. But for some reason, in this dream, the picture was in the side room. And it was a picture of Jesus on the cross. And the communion elements were right there in front of the table. By the way, this is a little side note. It so, it so happens to be that we had communion Sunday today. I didn't come up with this message because it's communion Sunday. It just so happened to kind of coincide. But I'm in a prayer room in this dream, and I'm in this room, and I'm reflecting on the love of God, and I'm partaking of the elements. And what happens is, is uh, all of a sudden I hear this sound. It was like the air got sucked out of the room, and it... it and by the way, this is not about the prayer. I want to give that as a qualifier. The Lord has shown me a different principle. But, but it was like his presence was, was taken out. I just, I just heard the sound. I was like, what was that? And I looked out, and as soon as I heard that sound, uh, the worship team, and the worship team, don't worry, I didn't see any faces, so I don't know who it was. <laughs> and they just started strumming. I mean, this song, I mean, just with everything in them, this Whitney Houston song, How Will I Know If He Really Loves Me? And it just kept singing it over and over again. And man, we were going for it. We had our hands raised. And man, we're just swooning and the whole deal, you know. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I wake up, I mean, from the dream and instantly just through my mind, I hear this phrase, sincere, but looking for love in all the wrong places. And what I instantly understood is that the question of how will I know if he loves me, it was answered 2,000 years ago. Now, beloved, no, really, it was answered 2,000 years ago. You know what? There's many things that the Lord does. He touches us. He, he heals us. He, uh, he provides for us. He brings restoration. He does all of these things. He says, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But those are not the proof of his love. The proof of his love. God demonstrated love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. No greater love is than this than a man laid down his life for his friends. For God so loved the world that he gave his begotten son. And this realm of the cross, this realm of his, of his blood, the Passover lamb, the Lord wants to bring us into renewed understanding and new understanding. What I mean by that, here in paragraph, uh, paragraph E, is that the, the Passover lamb brings us into all the benefits of the new covenant. And we... We um, limit the benefits to salvation and forgiveness. Now, how many of you are grateful for salvation and forgiveness? How many of you sleep a whole lot better because of salvation and forgiveness? Amen, right? So I don't want to downplay salvation and forgiveness, but that is not the totality 
of what was purchased in the cross. In other words, he, he didn't save us so that we can have the same conversation over and over again about our issues. Now, if you keep wallowing in the issues, by all means, have the conversation. But maybe we're stuck in our issues because we don't have a vision that there's more in store of what was purchased for us through his cross, namely, deep intimacy with the Trinity. Actually participating in the conversation that the Father has with the Son and that we get to enter into that conversation, number one, and number two, and that we get to participate with them as the plan of God gets unfolded in the earth called intimacy with God. Then there is a fourth element of the blood that is eschatological, if I can use that phrase. I'm going to bring up two things that are eschatological or that are end times in terms of their focus related to the blood. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, Paul makes a very powerful statement about God's plan to bring together, to join together all things in heaven and all things on the earth. In other words, the way the prophets said it is that, is that the whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the sea. Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10. Colossians chapter 1 Verses 1 and 20, Colossians 1, verse 20, Paul adds to it, he said, he said that heaven and earth are reconciled through the blood of his, uh, of, of his son. The blood of the cross is what makes it possible for the whole earth to be filled with the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the seas. And there are many, many, many other components that are involved in terms of his blood, we're talking about his atonement, we're talking about intimacy, we're talking about eschatology, we can talk about healing, we're talk, we can talk about deliverance. There are many, 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 many things about the, about the blood, and I really believe that the Holy Spirit wants to expound our understanding beyond the cursory understanding of salvation, as, as, uh, as salvation and forgiveness, though that is incredibly important, but he wants to take us deeper into the knowledge of him in terms of what is purchased through the shed blood of, uh, the shed blood of his son. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. It's the second eschatological point. Revelation chapter 12. I'm actually going to start in, um, in verse 9. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And John said that he saw the great dragon. That's a Satan. He said he saw the great dragon. And this dragon was cast out the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out as well. That is a statement of victory. The, the, the enemy was defeated on the cross, yes, but he's still operating, he's, but he's operated in a, in a limited way. He's limited by the cross, but there's something that's gonna happen uh, uh, in redemptive history where the church will grow in a place of authority and, uh, and maturity that results in the powers of darkness losing air superiority and being cast to the earth. And John says that when this happens, is one of the most powerful times in, in, in human history insofar as the power of God being released to the church is verse 10. He says, then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now, Salvation, strength, the kingdom of God, and the power of his Christ have come. Why? Because the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. Now, how did this happen? It happened because of verse 11 about the saints who overcame him. Now, there's a seven-year period of tribulation. I personally think there is a two-fold component to this overcoming of the accuser of the brethren. The first three and a half years of the, great, of, of the tribulation, the heart of Babylon, the great compromise in the earth, and a prophetic church will stand up against it and will be purified in an incredible way during those three and a half years. And that purification results in a power and an authority that causes the evil one to be overcome and be cast to the earth. That's, that's phase one, if I could say it that way. 
In phase two, he then enters into the most evil man in history, the, the eschatological pharaoh called the Antichrist, who will rule the world for three and a half years, and the church will overcome him yet again, resulting in the second coming of the Lord, the deliverance of the Jewish people, ushering the world into the age to come. But here is how it happens. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. This, we, need, we want to grow in our understanding and the experience of the blood of the Lamb. It overcame him by his work, his work on the cross, number one. Number two, and by the word of their testimony. Uh, their testimony is the gospel. It is the message of the cross, the message of Christ crucified and his shed blood, and all that it entails, both with regards to salvation, forgiveness, intimacy, and the full release of God's plan now and forever. So they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. If I can say it this way, they overcame him by the message of the blood of the lamb, and they overcame him by imitating the lamb of God not loving their lives even unto death. The cross all the way through. The work of the cross, the message of the cross, and the life of the cross is what causes the end time church to overcome him. Now page three. Oh, I forgot a very, very important part. It's paragraph G. Dialoguing with the Lord concerning this, his blood fills our heart with confidence concerning his love and commitment towards us. In my personal opinion, there's nothing that convinces my heart more every time of his love and his commitment than the revelation of his blood. And then the phrase, in the kind of barring a bickleism over here, Jesus, thank you for your precious blood. Show me more. If we would just add that into our prayer to the Lord, I think the Holy Spirit will surprise us. All right, page three. The blood that gives us confidence to enter in. Now, in John 13, verses 36 to 38, it's a very uh, interesting dialogue between Peter and the Lord. You know, it's clear at this point that Jesus is leaving and Peter says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answers, he goes, well, where I'm going, you can't follow. But you shall follow afterwards. And Peter says, well, why can't I follow you now? He goes, I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus answers, will you lay down your life for my sake? He goes, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. But what's happening here? Why is, why is this important to this conversation? Paragraph A, Peter and the disciples, they had their hope in a physical deliverance of David's kingdom. In other words, it's very clear by some of their comments and some of their interactions throughout the gospel that they had a deeply embedded temporal understanding, a time-bound understanding, so to speak, of what Jesus, uh, what Jesus was about. They saw, more than likely saw him as a, yes, spiritual leader, but a, he was coming to bring a social, political deliverance to them. And Jesus had told them earlier that week that he would die at the hand of the elders. However, here's the thing that's important, is that his death was not the death of a political martyr, but it was the death of the Lamb of God. You see, Peter, when Peter says, I will, I will die with you, he is thinking that Jesus' cause was natural. He's thinking that his cause was political. And the Lord goes, Peter, the thing that I'm up against, number one, the thing that I'm seeking to accomplish, number two, has forces that are at play. 
And there are implications, future implications that is involved. That your puny little sacrifice will not even make a dent in the purposes of God. That this is not just about, hey, bro, when the cost together, you know, let me be a martyr with you. The Lord goes, I appreciate the offer, but no. He goes, your zeal and your commitment is not going to accomplish what it is that the Father sent me to do. I imagine him saying, you know, Peter, you, you know, you can, uh, um, you know, you, you will hear of martyrs in the, in, in the days to come. You, you will hear of, of Gandhi who, who through his sacrifice, you know, confronted the British Empire. And he said, you will hear of the founding fathers of a country called the United States of America who laid down their lives for the freedom of the country. I imagine saying, Peter, the thing that I'm about to die for is not just to give you a little bit of a better life for 70 years. There's something much, much greater at stake here. There's something much more greater that's being made available, which is to bring the redeemed into deep, fellowship and relationship and partnership with the Trinity and the purposes of God being released in natural and uh, in, uh, th- uh, throughout creation. So Peter, he's wanting to bring his own zeal and sacrifice into the equation. However, Jesus tells him that he cannot at, that, at this moment. However, he says, Peter, but you will follow me after. In other words, he goes, the thing that I'm needing to accomplish It cannot be accomplished by your sacrifice. It can only be accomplished by mine. However, since you're in such a great mood to die, he goes, you will. But it will be built upon the foundation of my sacrifice. He goes, oh, you will enter into the fellowship of my sufferings. But it will be built upon the foundation of my sacrifice. Peter's most extravagant sacrifice is not sufficient and could not accomplish the will of the Father, which is access to the, to the Trinitarian fellowship. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, Jesus, uh, the writer of Hebrews said it this way. He actually shows us a Trinitarian conversation. He, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 7, shows us a conversation between the Father and the Son. And here's what the Son says to the Father. He says, sacrifice and offering she did not desire, Father, but a body you have prepared for me. Can you imagine that? Before Genesis 1, there is a dialogue between the Father and the Son. He said, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. He goes, sacrifice is not what you desire. And the Father goes, no. He goes, you have a body prepared for me. I will become a man. And I will pay the price that the redeemed can enter into this fellowship that we have. Paragraph C, the, uh, the Laodicean spirit seeks to engage the kingdom through self-reliance and self-sufficiency, which is self-righteousness or performance. I define performance as this. Performance is when we have confidence in our own sacrifice. It's not that we don't sacrifice. It's just that that is not the confidence that we have insofar as our access to the Lord. Oh, we make costly investments to position ourselves to receive freely from the Lord, but that's not our confidence. In Luke chapter 18, the Lord speaks of this Pharisee who comes before God. He says, God, he goes, man, he goes, thank you. I fast twice a week. He goes, I give a ton. So this brother was doing a GBF and putting money in the plate on Sunday. Okay, that's not I got too personal here. <laughs> and by all means, participate in the GPS, and by all means, put a little money in the plate. But when, you have, but when you come before the Father and your interaction with him, that fast thing and that money did not earn you a thing in terms of you being able to stand before him. There's a partnership that happens because of a sacrifice. And there is a life flow that we receive from the Lord where we can experience the the joy of sacrifice in giving and serving that flows from a heart that is received of his grace. Again, Father, would you give us grace to open our hearts to you? We're not just simply saying, Father, I'm going to open up my heart. He goes, you can't. 
He goes, you need me, Deuteronomy 29, 4. I need to give you a heart that yields, that's yielding, and that can see and perceive and be open. Paragraph D, you know, the Lord invites us, I'm gonna end it with this. The Lord invites us to the dining table in Revelation chapter three, verse, uh, verse 20. Now, here on the notes, uh, I put down some verses for you. Um, actually, I encourage you to look up any of them you want, but in this particular one, these verses, they all list the passages where Jesus is at the table with people. He's eating, eating with his disciples, eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, eating with the Pharisees, and so forth. And the reason why I looked up these verses was because I'm like, Lord, if you are calling us to the table, I'd like to know a little bit about what it is that you talk about around the table. And so John 13 to 17, we see a whole lot of what he talks around the subject of the table. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, we see some information about what he talks about around the table. But these passages are other passages where Jesus is at the table with people and he's teaching and he's instructing them. Now, what is interesting is that the Lord tells the church of Laodicea, hey, you are self-confident. You are so committed to doing the works of the kingdom without dining with me. He goes, this self-confidence, he goes, this self-righteousness gets confronted by coming at the table. And what you see at these, I could not believe it when I noticed this the other day. When you look at these verses, every single time Jesus is at the table with people eating, the teaching that he gives them is as a result of something that the Pharisees said or did around the table. So what happens at the communion table is our self-righteousness and our self-confidence gets confronted. And we get invited to say yes to his work and his grace and his power to live holy and abandoned lives. Let the worship team come up. The, uh, um, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 22. It's right there, the, last, uh, the second to last verse on the notes. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 22. It's a, uh, what is interesting about this verse is that uh, the community to which the writer is writing, they had actually fallen into the trap of self-confidence. They had, they had abandoned the substance of relating with God and had entered back into the form of religion. And so he spends 10 chapters uh, readjusting their thinking. And in here in verse 19, he, he, uh, he calls them to respond. And he says that with boldness or with confidence, enter the holiest, enter the fellowship, the holiest, is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, he, he's, he goes with confidence. He goes, come back and return to the relationship. But here it is, by the blood of Jesus. By the finished work of the cross. By the confidence in what it is that he has done for us. Number one. Number two, I want to skip a couple of points. He says, I want you to draw near. He goes, I want you to draw near with a true heart. And, and I think this true heart, what makes our heart true really is the cleansing power of the blood. That through the blood, our yes carries a value by which, to which God responds when we say yes to him. He goes, I want you to do this with full assurance. In other words, as you are, uh, as you've run into the various implications of self-confidence and all the things that come with that, he says, I want you to have confidence because of the shed blood of his son. You know, Hebrews chapter six, verse 20, it says that, the, that he was a forerunner. The word that literally means podromos. It is literally one who goes into an area of danger and secures it for us that we might engage with safety in that particular place. The only reason why we can have access to this most glorious awesome, beautiful, terrifying reality called the glory of God is because Jesus, the forerunner. Let's stand.
just want to take a moment and pray for a couple of people. And that is if you, if you are saying, you know what, this subject of the cross, that the Lord has really been kind of highlighting this in your life, and you'd be going, you know, there's more to this thing called the cross, Lord, show me more. If, if that's you, we want to invite you to come to the front and pray for you. Uh, the second group we want to pray for is that, you know, some of you are going, you know what, I've just really gotten myself into a jam in different ways over the years. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not even talking last year, but, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. And I know that God has forgiven me, but deep down inside, you have concluded, you know what, the depth of relationship that I want and the depth of relationship I know that he's made available to me, I don't think that that's available for me anymore. And I want to say to you that Hebrews chapter 10, verse 90 says, no, enter in with boldness and with confidence and know that because of the power of the blood, the relationship that he put in, that he gave you a vision for, and that is in his heart, it is still available for you as long as you breathe. If that's you, you want to see prayer, we want you to come to the front. For the Lord to break off the power of accusation and shame. Also, if you have sickness in your body, and you'd like to see prayer for healing, we're gonna pray for you. Some of you have been feeling a sense of oppression. The blood of Jesus drives away powers of darkness. Said the ministry team come up and just help us pray. Help us pray. 
um, for the people here. If you just attend regularly or on our staff or on our team, we just need a few more people here to pray for the ones who are standing here. It's only by the to it. 